Peter Perdue from the History Department. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Juan Cole here uh, this afternoon. And this talk is sponsored by the History faculty and by the Center for International Studies at uh, MIT. As you see on his title slide, he lists himself now as historian and blogger. Uh, but I'm still gratified to see that he puts historian first. <laughs> so uh, many of you may know Juan Cole the blogger better than Juan Cole the historian. I just thought I'd say a little bit about his historical credentials. Uh, he got his PhD from UCLA in 1984 in Islamic studies. Uh, since then, he's been a professor of history at the University of Michigan. Now he's Richard P. Mitchell Distinguished University Professor of History at the University of Michigan. And he's written many books, uh, but his original subject of research was the transnational Shiite religious movements in South Asia and the Middle East. That was long before most Americans, including the American government, had ever heard of Shiites whatsoever. But when 2001 came along, he turned out to be one of the very few knowledgeable experts uh, in the US on this subject. And luckily enough, he turned out also to be uh, a great speaker, a, uh, a great communicator with uh, audiences, and a really decent guy. <laughs> and uh, so he's made his name in another sphere, but he hasn't given up on history. I'm very glad to uh, know he's just published another book called Napoleon's Egypt Invading the Middle East. Uh, you know, by Palgrave Macmillan, 2007. Some Americans aren't aware that people invaded the Middle East before us, uh, but Juan is reminding us of that fact. The Middle Easterners have never forgotten it, of course. So he will uh, talk to us today on uh, Iraq's three civil wars and is the U.S. relevant to them. Please welcome Juan Cole. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that warm introduction. Uh, and um, thank you all for coming out on a uh, blustery Monday evening. Um, I want to talk about what I think is going on in Iraq. Of course, it's hard to tell. Uh, all war situations are a little bit opaque. Uh, but as far as I can tell from, from reading the Iraqi press in Arabic, uh, there are three major struggles for power going on of a political and violent sort. Um, and uh, the thing that strikes me and, and struck me when I uh, started thinking about these three major uh, power struggles is how little relevant the United States is. Uh, it is a superpower, and it is militarily occupying the country. But it appears most frequently to be in the position of going to the parties and saying, hey, guys, cut it out. Make nice, uh, please. Uh, uh, and, and it's odd. It's odd that it should be so powerless in some ways. Uh, but uh, let me try to lay out what I mean, just to remind us what we're, what we're thinking about. This is a, a, a very schematic map that has caused enormous amounts of trouble and shouldn't be taken too seriously. Uh, but it shows Iraq as three demographic zones, uh, the Shiites in the south and that green part is a uh, dense Shiite population, Shiite Muslims, Arabic speaking. Um, but it doesn't show that uh, Al-Zubair near to Basra is a largely Sunni uh, town of some 400,000. It doesn't show that Baghdad is mixed. Uh, so it doesn't show that northern Babel province near to uh, uh, Baghdad is mixed, and so forth. And then it shows the Sunni uh, Arab population as white in the center, west, and a bit north. Uh, again, uh, that's a uh, mixed area over uh, uh, to the east towards Iran. Uh, Diyala province is highly mixed, uh, and uh, Babel is, and uh, there are Shiites in places like Samara uh, and so forth. So uh, again, it's uh, misleading a bit. And in the far north, uh, the, the brown part is showing the Kurdish uh, areas of uh, population, uh, Kurds being not Arabic speakers, uh, but Sunni Muslims. Um, more sort of traditional and mystical in their orientation than the Arab Sunni Muslims who are more likely to be Salafis or uh, what the press would call fundamentalists. So what are the three wars? Well, I'm arguing to you that there's a war for Basra in the deep south. This is uh, uh, a port city 
uh, on the Shuttle Arab. It's uh, the body of water where the Tigris and the Euphrates have come together, and they flow together uh, then out to the uh, Persian Gulf. In the old days, it was a major port uh, of Basra because uh, uh, the ships could come up the shuttle out of from the Persian Gulf. So if you had a ship coming from Bombay, it would come up to Basra. But now, of course, the ships are so huge and they displace so much water, and the shuttle out of is, is just not big enough for uh, some of them uh, that they'll stop instead at a, a smaller port named Um Qasr uh, near to uh, Basra. But this is how you get things in and out of Iraq as, now th as things now stand. Because if you were an exporter, uh, it's, you could send them out overland through to Jordan uh, uh, going west, but that, that road is not secure, and Tom Friedman was mugged on it. Uh, and uh, uh, so your goods may not arrive. And then you could send them uh, north uh, over through uh, uh, Kurdistan to Turkey, but there's been some trouble up there lately, and maybe that's not a good idea for your convoy of goods either. So how would you get things out of Iraq is through Basra and Um Qasr. It's the south. Uh, and that's the major port. Uh, Iraq, last I checked, was exporting something like 1.8 million barrels a day of petroleum. Where is it exporting it from? Largely from Basra. Uh, there is some, about 300,000 uh, barrels a day are going out uh, through the north, but it's a relatively minor amount. So basically, import, export, lifeline, uh, and petroleum, all that stuff is, is, is centered in, in Basra. And if Basra were to collapse, then Iraq collapses. It would be like you know, putting masking tape over someone's mouth and tying them to a chair and leaving. Uh, so I don't see how the government survives. I don't see how anything goes positive in Iraq if Busra collapses. And damn it if I can figure out what's causing it not to just altogether collapse. But it's not a good situation down there, as I'll explain. Then there's a war for Baghdad. This is the one that Americans tend to know about because the U.S. troops are in Baghdad, and so it's being fought with, you know, all around our guys, and we get drawn into it from time to time. But you know, what Americans, mostly the American public, when it thinks about this war, they, they mainly think about attacks on U.S. troops, uh, which are part of that war because the U.S. troops were seen as, by the Sunni Arabs, basically as adjuncts to uh, the Shiite paramilitaries. And they have willy-nilly functioned that way. Most, most American observers of Iraq wouldn't say that the U.S. is an enabler of the Mahdi Army and the Butter Corps paramilitaries of these Shiite fundamentalist parties. But you can make the case that, functionally speaking, that's how it's worked out, because the U.S. has mainly taken on the remnants of the Ba'ath Party, uh, the Salafi jihadis, and other Sunni groups, uh, and uh, has tried to disarm them, tried to kill them, and so it has opened a space for the Shiite paramilitaries to claim territory, engage in ethnic cleansing, and, and, and gain territory and power. Uh, and uh, so um, that battle uh, between the Sunni Arabs and the Shiite Arabs is going on in Baghdad, is going on in the hinterlands of Baghdad, up uh, to the northeast to, to Diyala province, uh, and then south to, to Babel, uh, and so forth. And finally, uh, uh, as if all that weren't enough, uh, there is a war in the, uh, in the north uh, for uh, control of Kirkuk. Uh, it used to be called by Saddam Tamim province. Uh, Kirkuk uh, province is the, uh, has the city of Kirkuk in it, and those are very uh, productive oil fields uh, in the old days at least. Um, I think if they were properly renovated, uh, you could do easy 800,000 barrels a day out of them, or about a 1,000 wellheads. They're old fields. These were the ones that made Iraq an oil country back in the uh, 50s and 60s. But um, uh, uh, the Kirkuk, as it now stands, is one of Iraq's 18 provinces. Uh, it is not part of the Kurdistan Regional Authority, uh, which was created by melding three northern provinces together into a super province. Uh, and however, uh, the Kurdistan Regional Authority wishes to annex Kirkuk to the, the authority. So these regional governments are kind of super provinces or 
uh, provincial confederations. And it's just to try to imagine what has happened. Iraq had, uh, in, in the old days, 18 provinces, uh, but uh, it, it now has 15 provinces and one regional authority. And it would be as though Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana got together, erased their state borders, elected a joint parliament and a prime minister, and then told Washington if they, if they would like to communicate with any of those states, they need to go through the regional prime minister. And by the way, we're not sending any more money to Washington. This is the kind of thing, and don't, and don't even think about keeping federal troops on our soil. So this is what the Kurds have done. They have erased the provincial boundaries. They've created one uh, uh, Kurdistan government. They have, it has its own military. They're giving out visas uh, independent of Baghdad. They're inviting companies in to explore for oil independent of Baghdad. They're the Taiwan of the Middle East. They're an independent country. They just don't say that they are because it would cause a war. Uh, and there's a provision in the Iraqi constitution to make more of these provincial confederacies. Uh, and uh, some of the Shiites in the south are thinking about along these lines. So there is a war for Kirkuk uh, in the sense that there are Arabs and Turkmen there that don't want to be part of the Kurdistan Regional Authority. The Kurds, on the other hand, are very insistent on having Kirkuk because if Kurdistan has Kirkuk in the long run, it means Kurdistan is a viable country in its own right. Uh, and the Turks don't want the Kurds to have Kirkuk and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the fighting around Kirkuk, not only in Kirkuk City and the rest of the province and places like Hawija, uh, but it extends, I would say, even down to Mosul, uh, an Arab, a largely Arab city in Nineveh, where 70,000 Kurds have been chased out of Mosul. So there's this ethnic cleansing phenomenon of, 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 of Arab, Kurdish, and Turkmen fighting. Uh, and then there's an international dimension because uh, the Kurdistan Regional Authority, I think its officers mainly would like eventually to be an independent country, and because they are regional expansionists and they would like to add more uh, parts of Iraqi provinces to themselves, part of Diyala, uh, all of Kirkuk, uh, part of Nineveh, and so forth. And uh, uh, they seem to uh, have an eye on Kurdish population regions in Iran and in Turkey, ultimately adding them to themselves. So this is an aggrandizing, uh, regional, ethnically-based new state in, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, it, I think, uh, bears some resemblance to uh, uh, the phenomenon of Serbian nationalism in the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And we all know what kind of trouble that caused. And I think similar trouble is coming in the north of Iraq.